For, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mel Nettsheimer. I'm the Chancellor of Washington, Washington State University, Vancouver. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be hosting this event tonight, to be hosting the Board of, Governor, Board of Directors and the Board of Trustees over the, the next couple of days. Um, it, it's always, we love showing off our campus, but it's always an honor to, to have you on our campus. Um, we're, uh, so you'll hear a lot from him over the next couple of days, but our President Kirk Schultz is also with us this evening. And I'll introduce Bruce in, in just one second. Um, w one of the things that makes this event particularly exciting is that for, I think since the day I arrived on this campus, we have been having discussions about bringing programs from uh, the Edward R. Murrow College uh, to our campus. And I'm just really excited to announce that because of this partnership with the college, starting in the fall, we'll be offering strategic communication on, on our campus. So thanks to, to Bruce and, and to your team for the partnership and to uh, our WSU Vancouver faculty that I can no longer see in the glare of the lights uh, for the work that, that you've all done to, to make this happen. It's uh, monumental for, for our campus. Um, so tonight we're gonna be talking about trust at, at this Edward R. Murrow signature event. And I've just sort of been ruminating about that for a bit. You know, a few things happening here and there that <laughs> uh, might lead one to think about that. But you know, I, I have sort of, as I was reflecting on this, and, and for those of you who don't know, uh, my background is out of the Department of Communication. I was a, my, my PhD is from the University of Utah in, in communication. And I've sort of been thinking about this idea of trust in the, the media, but I think uh, for, for all of us that in our lifetime, it is a, a um, decline in trust of the institutions that uh, are supposed to watch out for us, that, that ha has been happening. It's not just the media. Uh, we deal every day now with a uh, diminution of the trust in higher education. And, and do people really trust the education that we're providing to our students? Um, we have lost trust in our religious institutions. We have lost trust in our government. And so what, uh, how then do the media fit into this, this um, decreasing trust in, in the institutions that, that we have? And so I think that's, that's been happening. We've seen more partisanship, the 24-hour news cycle, uh, has changed the way we think about news um, to, to begin with in, in really dramatic ways. It's uh, introduced a level of partisanship into the objectivity of, of news. And, and so managing all of that, I think, is um, particularly intriguing to me. And then we have sort of moved into the last election cycle where trust became something entirely different. We didn't even know if we could trust the words we were reading on a page. And, and what does that mean for the, the vibrant fourth estate that, that we're all committed to? And, and so I'm really, I think this panel tonight could not be more timely. And we are really excited to be uh, hosting it. And with that, I will turn it over to the Dean, Bruce Sprinkleton. Thank you, everybody. My name is Bruce Spinkleton. I'm the interim dean of the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication, and I am really excited to be here tonight. Can you imagine what a week we've had in terms of news? And it's only Wednesday. Is that honestly? <laughs> it's just mind blowing. Just think about it. I mean, seriously, I was nine or ten when Watergate happened. It pretty much went right over my head. This is the most tumultuous sort of news week. We've had a year's worth of news in the last seven days, I think. So. We have some outstanding panelists. I'm going to have you guys come on up right now and have a seat while I'm speaking. Uh, we're going to uh, be discussing tonight uh, the results of the Edelman Trust Barometer. 
this was a study, uh, is a study that Edelman Marketing Communications conducts every year. In this case, uh, this study ha took place in 28 countries with more than 33,000 respondents. And what the, uh, the results of the, of the barometer show is that trust in media, the sort of vaunted fourth estate of global governance, has fallen to a level that um, is now nearly that of equal to government. And so it's a distrust in more than 80% of the countries surveyed. I think there's a sense among citizens that uh, news organizations are politicized and um, struggling to meet the reporting obligations and also to keep up with the changes brought to us uh, by social media. Uh, we have politicians and business leaders and others that circumvent media uh, and journalists tough questions. They go directly to the public using social media. And so oftentimes that information lacks context, context rather, lacks understanding. Uh, or the understanding journalists can provide the background that's so useful to people. Uh, experts now talk about an echo chamber, so digital and social media essentially allow, allow us to seek information that supports our pre-existing ideas and perspectives, and we're not exposed to any information potentially that challenges our thinking, so it allows us to become entrenched in misinformation in some respects. Uh, in fact, the trust barometer results indicates that uh, people are nearly four times more likely to ignore information they disagree with than information they agree with. Four times more likely to ignore information they disagree with uh, than information they agree with. It's a, a world of peer reliance and self-reliance. The trust barometer indicates that 60% of respondents suggest that a person like yourself, a person like themselves, is a credible source of information about organizations as credible as a technical expert or, heaven forbid, an academic expert. So we wouldn't want to try, I know, we wouldn't want to trust an academic expert, but at least a technical expert you think we could trust, so. Um, uh, remarkably, a Pew Research Center poll showed last week that 90% of Democrats believe that news media play a watchdog role, that fourth estate uh, of governance, in holding political leaders accountable for their actions and only 42% of Republicans say the same thing. So we have a clear political divide there. And interestingly enough, the results of the trust barometer show that to be true as well, as uh, Trump supporters tended to show much less trust in media and much less trust in government than um, Clinton supporters. Um, have we, oh, and by the way, that's the largest gap ever recorded in that survey, uh, which has been conducted for more than 30 years now. Uh, have we lost the objectivity and, and uh, the benefits of a shared media experience? I read a quote the other day. I want to read this to you. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, Nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. The truth itself becomes suspicious by being put, put in that, into that polluted vehicle. So if you ignore the passive voice there, I'll do it one more time. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. Any idea who said that? Phone's down. There's no cheating. Any idea? Thomas Jefferson wrote it in a letter to John Norval in 1807, <laughs> which is even before I was born. Hard to believe, <laughs> but true nonetheless. 1807. So uh, consistent with that, the cinema was supported uh, by the results of a September 2016 Gallup poll indicating that only 32% of U.S. adults say they have a great deal or a fair amount of trust in news media. So we have real, um, real crisis of trust today, which is uh, what we're going to talk about. We have some outstanding panelists here. And when I say outstanding, I mean truly outstanding. These are people who've been recognized for their professional success and their personal success. And um, they're also connected to WSU in important ways. So just uh, so you know, OK? In alphabetical order. They are Lori Dankers. Uh, Lori. <laughs> you can read more about their bios in the, in the handout, but Lori is a Murrow grad and Seattle-based spokesperson for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. You may have been um, hearing about them in the news recently. She joined DSH, DHS I'm sorry, in 2006 as a spokesperson for the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and currently serves as a public affairs manager for the Transportation Security Administration. So she manages media relations and public affairs duties for a nine-state western region that extends as far east, I just learned, as Minnesota. And uh, talk about 
an amazing, challenging experience. How would you have, like to have Lori's job, <laughs> spokesperson for the TSA? Right? I can see some heads nodding, no, please. <laughs> so uh, very, very pleased to have her. Uh, Will Ludlum is a WSU graduate. <laughs> very nice. I, I love the support. OK. Uh, Will heads Edelman's uh, communication marketing work here in the Pacific Northwest. Prior, prior to joining Edelman, Will ran the Northwest offices for Hill and Knowlton. Uh, he also helped build the offices of Porter Valley, also worked for the Rocky Company and KVO. Will has worked with numerous regional and global clients for the past 20 years, and they include uh, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Safeco, Puget Sound Energy, Seattle Children's Hospital, uh, and many others. At a time when um, trust is in crisis, I suspect we'd all like to have Will giving us advice. So we have him here in the panel. Very excited to have him here. Uh, and then DJ Wilson. Thank you. Very good. So DJ is a Merle grad and also a member of the Merle Hall of Achievement. She serves as president and general manager of KGW Media Group, which is the NBC affiliate in Portland. RTDNA uh, awarded KGW two Edward Elmer Awards in 2017. And the Oregon Association of Broadcasters has honored KG KGW as station of the year 11 of the last 12 years. Pretty impressive, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also honored its uh, companion website, by the way. Uh, DJ Beginner began her career at Cairo TV in Seattle and has also worked uh, in Detroit, Atlanta, and Birmingham. And uh, like our other panelists, her career is marked by both personal and professional success. And one thing I've learned about DJ is that she'll tell you exactly what's on her mind. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why hold back? Yeah. So DJ, I want to know what's on your mind, starting, starting with this. Uh, there's a sense that news organizations are politicized. I have to tell you, that sense of things really isn't new to me. As a, as a journalism major in the 1980s, I heard complaints constantly from people that um, we were selling stories short, we weren't representing the, the full breadth of stories, we weren't telling stories from certain people's perspectives, those kinds of things. Uh, and I heard the same thing when I worked in local broadcast as well. So that, that doesn't concern me, but there's a new sense uh, that, that I, I get from talking with people. I think the extreme economic pressure uh, being felt by media these days, um, the need for journalists to use social media to try and engage audiences is certainly new. Uh, this role of citizen journalists and what that looks like and how that impacts the news gathering process is new. And uh, this has created concerns for a lot of people. So DJ, I wanna know, uh, do you believe these pressures have affected the quality of the news we receive? Well, I think that um there's no question that, so I'll start with the economic piece, I guess, because um, that's a reality. But at the end of the day, we're a publicly traded company, New York Stock Exchange. We have the 13-week oversight from the analysts, and so there's a, an enormous amount of pressure. But at the same time, you know, we as an industry have learned to be very, very efficient in the sense of we hub and we, we, um, uh, we consolidate and we do things in the back room so it allows us to put more resources against our content and our news product. Um, and less in just sort of the operations. And so we've gotten very smart about that. But you know, we, um, we have to understand what we do and what we don't do. I tell people every day, we're not NBC Network. We have the privilege of representing and distributing the NBC product in, the, in this market area. But we're local television, we're local news and information. And if we really stay true to what we do and do it really, really well, um, and we've doubled down on that. As a company, we've doubled down. We're very, very fortunate to have a CEO of our company who started as a news producer in Denver. He came up through the content side. He is a journalist journalist with capital J, and that's who's running our company. So we care very deeply about being uh, very true to the pillars of journalism. Now, doing that in this environment is very difficult, and how we've doubled down is that we've really looked at, we have 46 TV stations in 38 markets and all of the affiliated uh, digital products and platforms that we that we distribute product on. And what we've looked at is, is really what we need to do is we need to source everything that we do. We need to be very transparent. And we've started an initiative called Verify. And we are really looking at those stories where, and I'll just give you an example here at home. How is it that the state of Oregon has a $1.6 billion shortfall in their budget? and yet we're having one of the strongest economic 
eras in recent memory. How does that happen? On this end, you have this kind of debt, and on this end, we are, we can't, 100 people a week are moving to Portland, Oregon. You can't, it, we're one of the highest cost of livings now in the country because of the demand. And so we did a Verify story on that, and we really looked at how did that, and we peeled back the onion, and so we're doing longer form journalism, and we have the, we have the um, luxury to do that because we do have so many platforms. So we may have a short story on television, but then we can go right into our different digital assets, and we can continue the story, whether it's a video stream or whether it's, it's through our mobile device or online. And so it's really... Um, uh, we know there are a lot of challenges economically, but we, if we stay to the core of our knitting, which is we're not covering stories across the world, we leave that to NBC Network, um, and we're not traveling as much to stories. We have a network of 46 TV stations in the country that are our peer group um, you know, uh, cousins that allow us to tap into their resources. So, for instance, when we, we cover a story of... Um, it might be a sports story where we were down in Phoenix, you know, we'll rely on our Phoenix station to help support that technically so we don't have to have the resource to be down there. So scale does matter in the industry, and uh, we're seeing a lot more consolidation because of that. So let me ask you a follow-up then. Do you feel like social media has strengthened your news product or weakened absolutely. your news product? It has absolutely strengthened it. Um, a lot of challenges in social media because certainly, you know, so think about this. For those of you who live in this area, you may have heard of we had a gas explosion in, in the um, northwest recently. And so the explosion happened. We didn't, it was right in a commercial, uh, very vibrant retail area. We didn't have a crew there. And we literally almost sit at our, at our um, assignment desk and we go 10, 9, 8. We've got video. I mean, someone just calls us and says, we've got video. So consumer-generated content, CGM, is critically important. It all comes through social media. Um, however, I will tell you that just like we do fact-checking on all of our stories, we do fact-checking on our images. And so we don't just take an image. We fact-check that image. And we have tools and processes that allow us to fact-check images and so that we verify that they are accurate images and not taking an image from, and there was one that just recently circulated, it was an image, it was out of the Kiplinger Institute, it was an image of New York City with this enormous storm coming in, and it was in the 1950s, and then they overlaid a current skyline. So it felt like it was happening right now. Hmm. And we, we, reverse, we reverse sort of imaged the, and we found that you know, the, the image was from 58. So there's a lot of ways and tools now to try to verify that we're getting factual um, information. Okay, okay, good, all right. Uh, Lori Dankers, you work for TSA. If you have a complicated story, a sensational story. Daily. Daily, <laughs> fair enough. How, how do you feel about the media treatment you're gonna receive? Well, fortunately, for someone like me, <laughs> I, uh, I try to make myself very accessible. And one thing I, when I work with reporters, and I work with reporters who are very experienced, I work with reporters in very small markets, many of whom are in their first ever news job, and it's an opportunity for me to help mentor them as well as be a, a source for them. I always encourage them before they report to call me first. And I've made a pledge to them that I will chase down the facts as presented to me, but they need to provide me with all of the information that they have. As you can imagine, TSA screens about 2.1 million airline passengers every single day. It is like, I would like to describe it as the biggest retail job in America. And if you think about, um, in fact, I said to Bruce earlier, every one of you is a TSA uh, customer, if you will, because you've probably all been through a checkpoint sometime in the last year, if not more recently than that. So when we have a sensational story, and let's talk about Let's be specific. Maybe a pat down of a child that maybe happened six weeks ago at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Um, there were a lot of um, elements of that story that were not reported. For example, it was purported that that family was in the checkpoint for 45 minutes. Uh, 35 minutes of that was the police trying to calm down the mother. No one likes to hear that because that is an uncomfortable situation. Um, the reason that the child had to have a pat down had to do with the fact that he was actually 13 years old and by definition um, 13 and older is considered an adult and they are screened as an adult. Uh, his laptop had alarmed for uh, explosives during an explosive trace detection test. The rules are pretty clear across the board that at that point additional screening is needed. Uh, as a mom of a teenager, do I like seeing that? No. 
as someone who works at TSA and is privy to intelligence and reports about this type of thing, it does need to be done. People don't like it, and I'm not going to change their mind, but it's my job to try and get the facts out. The challenge that I have is a lot of times we are in a position where people don't want to report all the facts. It's too much information. It's too in the weeds. And when you have a video of a young man standing there being patted down, how could you say no to that? Mm -hmm. And so that is the challenge that's out there. But I do ask reporters to try to understand the larger picture. I try to provide that to them. But a lot of that has to do with work that I do uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. I try to be very transparent. I try to bring reporters in to a behind the scenes in the operations. I try to show them the backstory, if you will, to take them places that the public doesn't see, to walk them right up to that door of information that might be classified or confidential or secret in some way, but to give them a broader understanding so that when these circumstances do arise, I can remind them what those processes are. They've seen them up close in a non-charged environment, mm. and that can be very helpful. You know, the, the hard part of that is it takes a lot of my time and energy right. to go and do that, but it's a great investment that I make, because then I can call on their experiences that we had when it was less emotional, and then at that point, it's up to them to try and take that information in their reporting to serve the public better. So do you feel like the salacious details of a story will overcome some of the experience in terms of your investment uh, for journalists? It, it can, of course. You mentioned the citizen journalists. Everybody has a, has a phone with a camera now, it seems. A lot of information is documented, I can tell you, as someone who's a consumer of news and um, has uh, access to CCTV, let's say surveillance video of a circumstance. The video that I see often reported on the news is an excerpt or an edited version, because oftentimes what's provided is to the benefit of the person who feels like they haven't been treated well. And I completely understand that. Not everybody's perfect every time. Uh, with 2.1 million passengers every day, mistakes are going to be made. But at the same time, um, you have to keep in mind that, that, that people have an agenda as well. And I absolutely respect that, but I ask people to look at the broader context. And sometimes that information cannot be provided. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that video cannot be provided. But we have um, opportunities. Sometimes I can show reporters uh, video, they can't use it in their report, they can use the information they're reporting, but they can't show the video. And it gives them that broader context and it helps them do a better job. And that's my job to make sure that that happens. It can be a tall order sometimes, depending upon the circumstance. But, um, you know, in my field, like I say, if they're not talking about it, it would be a dull job. <laughs> <laughs> we could all use a dull job, I think, around here. <laughs> all right, very good, very good. Will Ludlam, you're the expert in this. I have two questions for you. For, let's start with this. What, what trends do you think are driving this distrust and lack of credibility? And the second question is how do we, how we build credibility? Uh, as far as trends, I will say that you know, the, the trust survey over the last uh, several years has shown this downward trend. So it's, it's clear that all four pillar institutions, and we look at um, – NGOs, government, um, media, and business. And uh, out of the four institutions, we've seen a downward trend uh, in, in all four institutions. Uh, business actually is outperforming, uh, I, I would say, the other four institutions right now. Uh, trends driving that, we're seeing a huge gulf. We look at, in the trust survey, we divide the uh, informed elites from the general public. The informed elites are uh, higher education, higher consumers of, of media, uh, generally uh, higher education and, and higher income. And then we look at the general population. And one of the things that we started to see emerge uh, this last year was this growing delta between the general public being far more distrusting than the, uh, than the informed elites. And we saw that intensify this year with more than double uh, of the general public having uh, globally having distrust uh, in, in the four pillar institutions versus much more trusting in the, the, the elite, the educated uh, public. So we're seeing this growing delta. I think it's reflected in the campaign that we had this, this year. At the same time, we're seeing this, this echo chamber that you had mentioned earlier as, as a growing trend. For the first time this year, Trust in a search engine surpassed trust in a media outlet or an edi editorial uh, source. Uh, I find that incredibly uh, worrisome. 
<laughs> I think we all know that Google has algorithms designed to make sure that we're getting content that that rein, you know that we, we want that that reinforces our our set of values and beliefs. So increasingly, we're not even exposed to, which I think creates you know, greater demand for the fourth estate than than ever. Uh, we're not being exposed to information that is different than our our values. Uh, so it, it makes things very, very challenging. Uh, as far as to the, uh, the second, uh, you know, the advice that we're giving clients right now, um, <clears throat> one of the questions that we asked this year was, uh, do you believe that the system is failing? And we, uh, we, we basically threw out those that believe the system is working, which was a very small number of folks. And then we threw out the people that think it's, it's failing because you know, they're going to be harder to reach. And we, and we looked at the undecided. And within the undecided population, we found that the highest uh, rated or highest, highest trusted institution was business. So we go to our clients saying, you're, you're, the, you're the last, last wall. You, you have an opportunity to have an impact. Uh, what do you need to do in order to, uh, to further trust and, and advance uh, the values of your organization? Number one, radical transparency. We live in a world where your brand is fluid. People are engaging with your, your brand on an ongoing basis. They think it's their brand, they can talk about it through social media channels. So you need to look at your brand as if it's a living and breathing uh, entity, and as a result, You've got to be completely transparent. Don't say anything about your supply chain uh, that isn't factually true. Uh, look to build values that reflect your consumers as well as your employee base. So that's the first thing that we that we that we tell them. The second is, as you mentioned, uh, what has really changed in the last several years because of social media is that this person like me or an average employee is the best spokesperson for your organization. So increasingly, more sophisticated programs to engage your employees so that they feel a part of the process, they feel empowered, they uh, represent your brand. Uh, so that's critically important. Speak through the voice of, of your, your employees. Uh, and then finally, understand that as a business, you don't have a license to operate, you have a license to lead. The expectation from uh, the public right now is that you need to serve a bigger, a bigger purpose than uh, just a profit. So you need to align your values as an organization to really reflect the things that you think uh, are important to your employee base, impl important to your, your customer base. Um, two examples in the Northwest, they happen to be clients in, in full disclosure that uh, I, I think really represent this. Uh, Starbucks, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years now, uh, decided to offer tuition to all of their employees. Uh, it was a, it's counterintuitive, it, it's a cost to Starbucks, but Starbucks understands that your experience with that brand isn't just the cup of coffee, it's the engagement with that barista. And they also realized that many times they're a first employer and they're dealing with often first generation uh, opportunity youth that, that maybe don't have a, a chance to go to college. So that by, in, by providing that opportunity, they are able to impact their employee base and also the experience that people have in interacting with that brand. And I think it's a, a great example. I think Howard Schultz is a great example of a, a leader that, that leads a values-based uh, 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 organization. The other one I think is really interesting, and it was also counterintuitive when they did it, was the REI opt-out campaign. Uh, if you're not familiar, REI, uh, and what's interesting is when you get the backstory, it was a, an employee that had raised it saying, you know, it would really be nice, we're an outdoor organization, if instead of uh, having a big sale on Black Friday, what if we actually closed and gave our associates the, the day off? Uh, REI made that announcement this last year in saying, you know what, rather than focusing on elbowing out your neighbor and, and we know that people that work for us are passionate about the outdoors, we're going to be closed. And we encourage you to participate in this experiment, to go outside. We encourage you to engage with us on, on social channels and share your experiences. And surprisingly, REI did not suffer a, a, a loss in their sales. They actually saw an increase. They saw 
a, a greater connection with their employee base, who are, are, are you know, the, the, the first ambassadors for the brand, uh, and it aligned with the values of the customers of REI. So you saw this increased engagement and passion for a brand that you know, arguably had been pretty quiet up until that point. So those are two examples, I think, of not a license to operate, but really that license to lead. Okay. okay. Yeah, I thought the opt-out campaign was outstanding. So interesting. So DJ, when um, when Will says that business is really kind of this last wall of trust, does that make you cringe a little bit? I mean, I know a lot of journalists, and they take their jobs incredibly seriously. This rule, of the fourth estate. I mean, you're you're bathed in it at the Murrow College. It's a it's a, it's a calling for us. Really, we say Murrow's our north star, and and we mean that. And, um, and here Will is saying, well, really, it's REI that's more trusted than media. What, what, how do you respond to that? How do you, you build know, um, it's, trust? It's interesting because um, I, I would say candidly that many of our journalists have really been rocked this year since, uh, well, and through the election. And um, at their core, they're very much public servants. They want to serve. They're watchdogs of society. They, they feel a real strong uh, sense of responsibility uh, to inform and educate and and they understand what that means. And, and so it's been a really challenging time. But we really, you know, we really have talked a lot about our culture, about reinforcing how important is what we do has never been more important. We are the only profession that's written in the US Constitution, a free press. In the absence of a free press, we know what's happening around the world. So that puts even that much more sense of responsibility, but sense of purpose with our uh, journalists. And, and so in some ways, it's been hugely rewarding as well. I do want to just go off tangent for one moment, if I might, because we were talking about this in a really, um, really sort of deep discussion the other day with a lot of our, our top executives in my executive leadership team. And we were really talking about that, that it has been, um, the media has, has we've, we're not used to being part of the story. And so that's been a really big challenge for us as we've seen the spotlight come on to us. And, and we've really talked about how did all this happen. And for those of you, I've spent my entire career in broadcasting, and broadcasting is a highly regulated industry. Um, and in, in that context, we used to have what was called the Fairness doc Doctrine. And the Fairness Doctrine literally, essentially, was a framework in which if we were going to put on our air a point of view or an opinion, then you had to have the opposing point of view or opinion to counterbalance that. So it was sort of point-counterpoint. And over time, those regulations were relaxed. And at that point, when they were relaxed, then that, that began the proliferation of talk radio. And talk radio began then with a really, oftentimes, a singular point of view, whether you were far right or far left, you then had the opportunity to have the pulpit where you could talk to that point of view. And so it wasn't, that's not journalism. That is, that's opinions, that's discourse. It's, uh, but what happened over time is that people began to really gravitate towards people who looked like them, talked like them, thought like them, and sort of acted in effect for them. And so just recently, um, and the um, CEO of the Oregon Association of Broadcasters is here, a fellow Coog, Keith Shipman. And um, we had the opportunity to have Gordon Smith be a speaker at a function in, in uh, Portland. Gordon Smith was a, uh, a state senator for Oregon, then he became a federal, and he was a, a, a federal senator for us, a state senator. And then from there, he became the president of the National Association of Broadcasters. And he spoke to our group and he said, I ask that when I talk in front of classes, when I'm in academic institutions, when I'm in front of young people, I ask them to earn their opinion. All I ask is that you earn your opinion. You don't take someone else's opinion. So the only way you can actually legitimately earn your opinion is to sit on the other side of the argument for a period of time, to visit that other side, to study it, to research it, to reside there. You may come back to this point of view, but you've then now earned it. It's your opinion, not someone else's. And he said, I talk a lot about that, and I think about my education at WSU and what, what the Murrow College stands for in terms of an academic institution, and it really is helping students in critical thinking. And so when you talk about this, this study, Will, 
and, and that, that divide, the divide in the individuals that have less of a trust of media and other institutions are less informed. They've yeah, not absolutely. earned their opinion, they don't understand the value of critical thinking, and they haven't had that, 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 um, that framework that has really driven how they think about things. And so that actually not only puts uh, media in a, a much more, you know, the burden of, of trying to facilitate that is much higher, but I would say it's much higher for the Murrow College as well. Do you, do you think, I, I feel like we're at a moment where in these dark days there is so much news and your role is so critically important that, that, uh, important that this could actually be a, a, uh, a golden, we could be on the edge of a golden era because of the importance that you will play, I think, in addressing some global issues, certainly some U.S. policy issues. We, I mean, we feel that way. We feel, you know, we've always felt like we give context and analysis. Right. And there are, it's not so much economics, but it is sort of the time constraints, I would say. So I suppose that's all sort of bundled into one equation, but um, particularly in broadcast. You know, it used to be, some of you, I, I, like me, although I, I, I was still in school, um, the Vietnam War was, it was a, a defining moment because that war was played out on television. And if you saw it in video, you believed it, right? And so the trust of video and television at that time had never been higher because people said, I saw it for myself. It really happened. That, that happened. That event happened. I saw it. So now we trust that the video is not right. Someone's edited it. There's an image there, you know, whatever. And so the burden to be um, transparent, as you've said, and, and to really verify what we're doing has created in our shop, uh, I think, better storytelling. <laughs> I think we are much more serious. We don't take what we do casually. Uh, not that we ever did, but now it's so important. So I do think that pendulum will swing. I really do. I do too. Good, good. Laura, I have a question. Actually, I have a confession and a question. So on my way down, <laughs> I, uh, oh, I had to go through security. I actually had TSA pre-check, <laughs> as a matter of fact. And um, every time I go through security, somebody complains to me about TSA. I mean, it's just kind of routine. It's just sort of people chattering in line, those kinds of things. So They I complain was, to me, too. They yeah, I'm know. sure they do. <laughs> and they don't know who you are. <laughs> uh, probably you more than me, as a matter of fact. I'm just a strange old guy that they you know, happen, to, happen to glom onto. But um, I'm curious, you know, hearing, um, hearing what Will's talking about, building credibility and, and DJ's emphasis on getting a story right. It strikes me as a government employee myself, sometimes working for a government is really a pain in the neck. I mean, you're constrained in some significant ways that you wouldn't be if you were REI as an example. So how do you think TSA can build credibility? I mean, it's, it's in a sense, it's everybody's favorite punching bag, government in general, I think, in some respects. But, but how do you, what's your sense of, of how, how to build credibility? And well, I'm going to come to you next with some advice for Lori on, on how she can build credibility as well. And audience, I'm gonna throw it open for Q&A in just a few minutes as well. So um, so listen, but also be thinking about a question if you have one, all right? Lori, go right ahead. <laughs> well, it's a daily challenge, yeah, I will is, say that, right. because uh, every day is a new day, every day brings another challenge, and at any moment I can go check my phone and something could be very problematic. And a lot of those are outside of my control because it's operational, and because I'm not an operational person, but I represent what they do, I have to work within the constraints of that. I can tell you, though, that my policy is always to make sure that I provide all of the information that I can to describe what is going on, to make sure that they know that what I'm giving them is factual, and if something changes, and I've had to do this before, I call them back and I correct that record. Because I want them to know that I'm not misleading them, that sometimes the facts can be complex, sure. sometimes the situations can be complex. And keep in mind that a lot of the stories that I deal with started out on Facebook right. or started out on Twitter, and that was one person's view of what happened. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes the, the media will pick those stories up, right. and it can be difficult to chase the other side. Sure. And as you said, it's easy to be a punching bag, it's easy to complain, people don't like the process, but I would um, offer the flip side, if there were two planes and one was uh, full of passengers screened by TSA and the others were those who just walked on, ask yourself which plane you're getting on. Yeah, right. and, and so it's sort of a necessary evil, and I understand that, but my job is to explain we do it why we, you know, why we do that, sure. 
and to every day try and meet that challenge. And some days are easier than others. Um, some days at work are worse than others. Uh, I'm sure. But all in all, um, it has been a, a great challenge, but also a great privilege to take those on. Ah, okay. And what makes it a privilege, privilege in your mind? Well, I think every time that I'm able to turn a story, you know, in my job, in my job, sometimes no story is a victory. Right. Being able to talk right. a reporter out of something that is not is it, it either it didn't happen as described or the information that they have, it really doesn't benefit anybody to keep repeating that. So oftentimes I'll try to explain that and work on something and actually try to flip it around and say, if you want to report on that, let's report on something that would be more accurate or more complete. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, one of the metrics that we use in my job is how many stories you're able to kill because they're not relevant. They're not helpful to you as a, as a consumer Very of good. the news. And I can tell you, good reporters understand that. Right, yeah. They do. No doubt. Um, a good reporter doesn't necessarily mean you're a seasoned reporter, but it yes, means you're right. a serious reporter who cares about the types of stories that you cover. Right. And those good reporters do want to pursue that angle. And it's not that we're trying to talk them out of doing a story, but rather as we're trying to talk them to tell a fuller story. Right. Working for DHS, I mean, it's full of challenges every day. I mean, you haven't lived until you have to explain a grandmother getting deported oh, right. or a parent uh, being taken away who has a severe criminal history to be removed from their children. And I've had reporters on ride-alongs, in fact, one of your reporters, um, a few years back and to explain why that was the case and it's not easy but it is part of the law and our job is to enforce that law yeah. and so um, it can be challenging and I will also mention that oftentimes especially on the immigration side many reporters are in fact advocates for one side or the other and that can be very very challenging hmm. but it's a challenge I don't shy away from because I think that it's important that they see the ramifications of that Good. And so um, it's like I said, it's not always easy, but it is a necessary. Right. Outstanding. Good. Good. Okay. Then, Will, as promised, we have. Uh, we have I'm listening. I'm all that's ears. That's right. We have TSA here. Well, I'm going to broaden it a little bit because I, I, I think the challenge that we all face, and I, I think just as consumers of information as well as organizations that are, that are trying to provide information, is with the advent of social media, we're all so reactive and we're all so immediate. And we end up in this table tennis of back and forth, back and forth. And I'll, I'll, the, the example that I'll use, I, I think we need to provide space to let something evolve over time. Uh, there's that, there was an article in the New York Times uh, sometime I think in the last six months that was talking about in, um, in the ER, there's the golden hour. And that's if I can get somebody in and I can deal with the trauma. This is when, when somebody's experienced uh, a, a traumatic uh, body uh, event. Uh, if they can get to them within that golden hour and provide uh, medical services, there's a chance that the, the chances of them surviving go up significantly. And I think in communications, there's also the golden hour of we either can do a lot of damage or, or we, can, we can do no harm. And then I think we typically fall into the habit of moving on to the next thing. And um, we, um, our team in Seattle, launched the Galaxy Note 7. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I, I can't, I, honestly, in my entire career, I can't think of a, a product that on every plane flight, your target market is hearing an announcement <laughs> saying, don't use your product. Wow. Um, the immediate reaction was 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 you know it was devastating, and we were dealing with a with a client that you know had had a Korean culture of saving face and and don't show your mistake, and so there was the immediate reaction, and they definitely had some missteps. But the one lesson for me was that <clears throat> because the company went back and they did all kinds of testing, and then about I think it was like eight to nine weeks later, came out. Uh, with an analysis on what had gone wrong. We produced a video, uh, it showed where the batteries had failed, and then they proceeded to talk about, and here are the steps that we're putting in place that will ensure that this doesn't happen again. That was a, that was a conversation that couldn't have happened in the moment. And it required that we have this longer arc story. And you know, I will say, uh, they just launched uh, the new Galaxy 8 in New York a couple of weeks ago. And the response from the media, actually, I'll say the response when they came back and said, you know what, we made a mistake. 
and we did the analysis, and here's what we're going to do moving forward. And I think if we all start looking at the longer arc of what the story is and avoid that, I just need to, I need to respond, uh, there's a chance to overcome what can seem impossible in that moment, in that golden hour. Outstanding. Good. <laughs> Great. All right, Lori, there you go. So I'll be using that advice as well in my role as, as interim dean. All right. So as I mentioned, um, it's about the top of the hour, so we're running over just a little bit, but we're going to take Q&A from the audience for a few minutes, okay? David Bielski, Department of Communications, 1970. Long before Murrow was the college or even the department. DJ, I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't think it's KGW, Cairo, or any of the other, if you will, trained broadcasters that are the problem with the media. The vast majority of them are well-trained, they're responsible, they care, just as you said. The biggest problem is in the amateur that's never done this. They really don't know what they're doing. They take a video, they publish it. It's also the finger pointing, the misinformation from on high, from every level, including our current president. And yes, I am a Republican. That's as far as we're going to go with that one. Uh, there's too many people saying too many things too quickly without thinking about it that all of a sudden becomes gospel. Mm -hmm. And you cannot fight that. I don't care how hard you try, as good as you are, and as good as your staff is, mm -hmm. right. they're behind the eight ball. Well, you know, um, the bar of entry is very low into the conversation. And frankly, the bar used to be very high. I mean, we all, maybe not all of us, but many of us remember when you know Walter Cronkite would say, and that's the way it is, or, you know, uh, what is it, good evening, good night, you know, uh, the Murrow uh, term, where it just sort of was, this is the news of the day, and I am the most um, knowledgeable, uh, yes, individual to speak to this. And so now the bar is very low. And given that the bar is very low, uh, there are, there's a lot of, of um, there's a lot of turbulence in the environment. And, but what has happened, interestingly enough, is the New York Times, for instance, uh, they are having record subscriptions right now. So you're seeing this transition of people saying, I have to go to trusted sources, I have to choose my advisors carefully, I have to be sure that I can go to a source that I can rely on. So we're seeing that shift. And I, you know, there's going to be a lot of chatter out there. And um, I think at the end of the day, though, hopefully the, the real um, the real research news will rise to the top, and that will get right. And 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 so we we understand that, but we're not going to change all of this conversation down here. It's just it's the tools are there, and you know really in some ways, um, if we can leverage off of that, meaning if an event happened right now here, each of you have a device in which you could begin to report a story. You would have video, and you would have an opportunity to firsthand witness to an event that would happen. And so in many ways, that does, we used to have a saying at KGW, where the news comes first. We abandoned that because we said, we are not where the news comes first. The news comes first on a Twitter feed, you know, probably by you. So um, what we do then is take it, and, and then we vet it for facts, accuracy, and we give it context and analysis, and that's the role we feel we play. And we do think there's a real appetite for that, an increasing appetite for that. Hi, Rich McKinney. Uh, recently, in the, uh, this relates to the Fairness Doctrine. Recently in the news, a Sinclair company uh, yes. purchased a lot of uh, TV stations, Tribune stations, and, they, uh, and in the course of that, as you well know, they, they tend to uh, sometimes force the stations to report a certain point of view, uh, which, is, which is more opinion than, than uh, necessarily just the news. How does it affect your credibility, and what can you do about I, that? I, I think it's extremely troubling, and I... Um, you know, uh, I have to be careful here because obviously they're a huge competitor of ours, but uh, what I would say is that um, I have been in the commercial broadcast business for almost 40 years. I have worked for several large broadcast companies. I have never once in my career had anyone corporately or in some sort of regional executive leadership role tell me I must air something. That has never happened. 
And so when Sinclair, who had been a smaller group at one time, and then, because there was a cap on ownership, so you could only own some, so many stations, they started to buy bigger markets, and they bought Como and K2, um, so the Fisher stations. There was sort of a sensibility they're in it only for what's called spectrum. They were just going to sell off spectrum. They were, weren't in it to be journalists. And then a funny thing happened. They owned a station in Ohio, and all of a sudden there was all this political money in 2012, and they said, wow, there's a, there's a real business here. If we have a, a good news product, we'll, you know, we'll be able to, to leverage a pretty significant uh, revenue stream from it. So they started to invest in their stations, and I, I understand they've invested in Como pretty heavily, and they've invested in K2. Um, and so this just recently, because that was in the New York Times on Sunday, um, and this, this uh, relaxation of regulation and the consolidation that's happening in the business, they will have over 200 TV stations, and that is, some in, you know, duopolies and things, um, is very troubling. I, I just find it, I, uh, I don't know where it will, will end, but I just find it really a difficult trend that in, could have real impacts in the entire industry, and I, I, I don't know, I almost renders me speechless. I've just never experienced it, and we would not, we wouldn't do it, so. All right, can you hear me? Okay, so Brian Lockett, I have a question for you. Is there any sort of certifications in your industry? And really what I'm getting at is, is that are there certifications that can be revoked for bad journalism? <laughs> because, for because example, I'm a financial like advisor. People. How's that? And I have a, a certified financial planner designation, and there's a whole code of ethics and so forth. And so if I'm found to be, you know, acting unethically or untruthfully, that can be revoked. But at the same time, having that mark is also valuable. And I don't know of any certifications as a, a, a constant news watcher. And so it seems to me that a selling point would be having a certification that is saying, you know, a certain mark. Because I hear about an, you know, a, a Edward R. Murrow uh, recognized station and things like that. But I never hear of anything saying, you know, here's a certification and here's its standard and here's the code of ethics that we're held to and so forth. And, you know, if someone comes out and produces a bunch of bogus things, then they can have that, re you know, revoked. Prior to deregulation, the news portion of the station was not necessarily a profit center, was it? It was a public service. And it, and it sure seems that we need to get back to a point where it's not. I don't think that's going to happen that yeah. way. But what I will say is that, um, is that uh, the Murrow College, along with other J schools, absolutely teaches a code of conduct, ethics, and, and principles in journalism. And we interview for that. We, um, we uh, hold our people highly accountable to uh, how they portray a story. And the, so the certification process is not something that does exist in our business. But there is a process of checks and balances and controls and script approvals and things that happen. And we know when we have a journalist that, that takes shortcuts or doesn't do the appropriate research, and they don't, they don't stay with us very long. So that's, that's the a lever that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we actually think the credential from the Murrow College is that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the legacy of uh, the late Professor Val Lindbergh is ethics and that students at Washington State do learn that. And, you know, we would hope that they would apply that in their career and people like DJ being on the lookout for that. But, you know, it's a market, it's a market uh, place. You know, if, if, if people are really out there and no one listens, they go out of business. That's the way it works. But, but in this environment, there seems to be a message for everybody, and they tend to, right? It's really good management. I mean, it really just has to be your executive management in your newsroom that really is going to make that happen at the, at the core level. Because we can say that, and you know, you can create a culture where 
we do eight hours of live news a day, but we're 24-7, as Bruce said, and, and so we're feeding the beast all the time, and that demand to feed that beast and the amount of news that happens, and I was laughing, I mean, really, this is so tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, you have real news and fake news, you have twice as much news, so we have lots to deal with, and so, um, so it's so crazy that, that uh, we have to make sure that our people have the capacity to deal with the demand. And if we have too much demand, then we're going to take shortcuts and we're not going to get the product out there that we want. And, I, you know, listen, I'm going to follow my story and say we're guilty of that sometimes. So we're really trying to look at that workflow and making sure that we, we provide an environment where people don't have to take those shortcuts and, and, and they do have that oversight. You, I was just going to add that I, I do think on the social media side, you, you have Facebook finally standing up and saying that they, exactly. they will work to identify fake news, which I think... You know, we can have ethics and standards that doesn't, Breitbart uh, doesn't change. And so we, we need, I, I think, other tools to identify something as real news versus fake news in, in a meaningful way. All of us are, are here to support uh, the, our university, to, to uh, get fellow donors to continue to support the great education of Washington State University. My question relates a little bit to the Sinclair uh, reporting or out that they want to uh, take a little more conservative view of, of things. To the media and those, what impact has the uh, Supreme Court decision of Citizens United had on the, uh, on the media? Because we see all of these uh, uh, political groups uh, getting all these donations instead of the universities to support uh, scholarships and other things. And what impact has had that have those conservative groups, those think tanks and others where all this big money, plus the support of these think tanks and conservative groups on politicians that impact uh, the bottom line of the uh, media outlets? How has that, uh, what impact has that had on the media? Well, there's no question that um, because that's gone unchecked, so to speak, that the money has been absolutely unbelievable. But it is shifting in the sense that it's used to be very much, um, obviously, we were the beneficiary of it, quite, you know, commercial broadcast. You couldn't get elected unless you had money and you were on television. I mean, it just ended report. Um, you know, some of that's still true today, but I do think um, uh, uh, it's a troubling trend. There's no question that if you have the right amount of money, you can get elected. And so it's not um, – money can buy an election in a really interesting, transparent way, actually, in some ways. I know I say transparent because you know that that money's being spent. We have a public file. You can go into our public file and see exactly what people spent on which candidate. And so not the issues. The issues are still not required to be in the public file, but the candidacy money is. So I, I, I was very surprised by that decision, extremely surprised. Us and the media were very surprised by it. I will say, if you look at this last election, though, you know, the, the demise of that money will be the fact that um, the, the populism platform that Bernie Sanders had momentum behind, that Trump had momentum behind, um, really there was, a, I mean, it was, that was an individual movement. And, you know, Trump himself, uh, avoided a lot of that that money, and, well, and, and it, the right. polls were wrong. And right, right, right. you know, I think that model may over time be. I think it is. I, that's what I meant by shifting. I, I really think that anymore, sort of that <coughs> consumer-generated media can be as powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and that's what happened with Bernie Sanders' campaign. You know, really was grassroots and really, and so there is a way to um, to impact that so that it it somewhat marginalizes that. It's a fascinating time, really, um, about that. I don't know if I'll change it. Sure. Um, you started with a quote about Thomas Jefferson and how the media wasn't trusted. And, you know, you look back in history and there were a lot of wealthy people who owned papers and other things. And again, I don't think the media was necessarily trusted at that point. Are we exiting a 50-year period of sort of golden news that is really the exception and not the rule? Has media been more mistrusted historically than trusted? <laughs> you 
No, I, th I think that when you had less voices, I mean, think about it, there was a time when there were just three networks. And there's no question that the power play in any market was the big newspaper. And the newspaper endorsed candidates, they had editorials, but they were very transparent about that. They disclaimed it as such. So um, to me, um, but just something that Will said earlier about, I think that pendulum will shift. I, I think that more than ever, smart, capable people will want to uh, seek out trusted sources. So I really, b I, I have great confidence that smart people will seek that out. I think our challenge will be that we're just going to have to have a lot of scholarship money and we're going to have to have a lot of people who are going to be enrolling at WSU because in the absence of a college education and an education, then um, it's true that uh, uh, the divisive um, data here around trust will probably proliferate. But I'm hopeful that, I mean, we, I, I every day, I'm in, uh, I, I'm in City Hall, I'm, I'm working with businesses every day, and they all are saying, keep up the good work, keep doing what you're doing, fight the good fight, we're counting on you, you are so important to us and um, don't give up. I mean, really, that's sort of, they know we're battered, they know we're under siege, they know that we're becoming part of the story when we don't want to be. Um, and, and they just say, fight the good fight, because we're, you know, we're counting on you. So I, we feel a lot of support, I have to say. I, I do think that in the time of Jeff Jefferson and in and, and other eras of, of journalism, um, it took days to <laughs> get the news out. Right. And I don't think, as a society, we've come to grips with having constant information uh, impacting how we interact with each other, how we form opinions, uh, the power of big data. There are some big societal uh, changes happening right now that I don't think know if we can necessarily wrap our head around uh, or know the path forward. I mean, it's, it's, it'll be add big data to that and uh, privacy rights. And I think we're, we're going through something that is, it, it's certainly bigger than, than journalism. Uh, so this is Not my favorite quote right now. We are data obese and we're knowledge starved. Amen. Oh, that's good. So there you I go. often ask new reporters, you know, why did you go into journalism? What made you want to be, especially a newspaper journalist in this day and age? And I can tell you that this new generation of people in the news business are committed to telling a story. And they said, I don't care what the trends are. I'm going to buck that trend and I'm going to do this because it's what I care about. It's what I've wanted to do for a long time. And it's interesting to hear them say that when there's just so many fields that they could go into, they're choosing that. And they're starting in these small towns. And uh, those are the ones, when you, when you work with them, they're dogged. And, and uh, there is that next generation coming up. We'll see how long they last. But it is encouraging to know there are people out there doing that. Yeah, I agree. We're seeing that in the Murrow College, as a matter of fact. So hey, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much. Round of applause. <laughs> I, uh, I've been excited for this all day, and it's been a terrific event. The panels have done great. I know I'm standing between you and beer, so hold on just one second here. I, uh, I just have to do a few thank yous uh, quickly. Uh, special thank yous to Bruce Almondson, uh, Paul Casey, Chateau Saint-Michel, Edelman Communication and Marketing, Full Sail Brewing, uh, David and Sandy Glatley, the uh, Val E. Lindbergh Media Ethics Lectureship, Keith Shipman, and our host of Vancouver campus. So thank you guys very much. Really appreciate your participation today. Have a great evening and go Cougs. Go Cougs. All right. Thank you everyone. <laughs>